In this video, we're going to look at an HTML page with an SVG, Scalable Vector Graphics, element that is empty and that will be populated by JavaScript. And it's going to create a design inspired by this work, Gamma, by Victor Vazzarelli that you're seeing right now. So these sort of concentric circles, then there's a, uh, a thicker line uh, that is generating this uh, idea of a square. So that is the, the sort of inspiring work. And uh, that's not what I wanted. Here is, so I've got these sort of circles and this sort of square. I've uh, made it sort of a sort of brightly colored, a little variation in the brightness and the sort of rotating. But the basic idea is there, the concentric circles, the, the patterns generating that sort of square pattern on the inside. Okay, so here we go. Uh, I have some style. Uh, things are centered. I have a variable to sort of establish the size. This is actually establish, establishes half of the size, 300 uh, pixels. And then here I'm using that. So that is uh, within the style colon root and dash dash. So this is how you sort of identify an area that's giving you the CSS variable. And then the, here's the specific variable. And then here's how you can use the variable. If you want that number to be used in the style, you uh, say var and that gets you the number. And then if you want to do any calculating with it, so it's got some units, so it will be uh, working with it and you know doing any math with it involves dealing with the units and so there's a method calc sort of handle that so i'm getting i'm styling the width of my svg element to be twice of that half size which will be 600 pixels in this case here's my the body of my page a title an svg element which is empty and everything else is script so all that design was created by the script. OK, I'm going to generate uh, all the elements that go in the SVG uh, dynamically. I'm going to have, I think, 24 of these concentric circles. I have a, a timer. So down here on 46, I'm using set interval. I'm going to call a function gamma every 33 milliseconds. And that's going to establish for me a timer ID. That, that's what set interval does, is it, it returns a timer ID in case you want to, in this case, stop the timer. I'm not going to stop the timer, but I often end up stopping the timer in when I'm debugging. So if I'm generating an error, I don't generate more and more errors as time goes on. And so that's why, that's one of the reasons I like to have the timer ID, just to keep the good habit of get, you know, remembering the timer ID in case I need it. I have something that varies in time. So I have a time variable. I have a, uh, the, the H is for the hue. I'm picking it out randomly to start. The hue is in this color model is an angle in degrees, so between 0 and 360. The, I'm going to have a random amount of saturation. I'm going to be changing the color. So that the colors, this is just the starting point of color, then it's going to vary in time. I have a saturation, which I'm picking out randomly. So I'm getting a random number between 50 and 100. Um, and uh, that is fixed in time, so I'm not going to vary the saturation. And I've got sort of the whole thing sort of rotating. And so this is sort of, uh, it's just a W, but I'll think of it as a omega, which is the standard letter for designating an angular frequency. This next part is me getting, I have that half size variable in my style. This is me sort of grabbing that. A CSS variable and making a corresponding 
JavaScript variable, especially with all of these, uh, this sort of center of circles are going to be at this sort of half size point, both horizontally and vertically. So that's what this M is. And I'm dividing up M, the sort of total possible radius into num, into 24 regions. And so that's the sort of spacing between my various radii. And then this is related to how big this square number is, how sort of half the side of a square. So I'm taking the square at its, its the biggest distance in a square from the center is along the diagonal and that involves the square root of two. So I want square to not be this diagonal distance, but to be the sort of the side, really half the side. So I'm dividing by the dividing by the square root of two here. And then I didn't want it to go all the way out to the edge. So this 80% is I'm just the I'm going up to sort of 80%. So and that matches uh sort of what Vasarely did. So his square doesn't go all the way. Here's the largest part of the square doesn't go all the way out to where the uh, circle, the outermost circle is. Okay, so again, here's me starting the timer. It calls the function gamma. Everything else is in gamma. Uh, I am clearing out anything each time the timer is called, I'm clearing out everything that might have been there before. Again, I have a some of my uh, SVG elements that I'm adding will have no fill. So I don't want to be seeing an old one behind the new one or anything like that. So I'm clearing everything out. Um, but I'm also, so this is sort of, I don't know, belt and suspenders, as the British might say. Um, Sort of here I'm clearing everything out, but here I'm also adding a great big black rectangle that sort of fills the space. Um, and here I'm evolving my time, and here I'm evolving my color, my hue, and it's modulus 360 so that I'm always between zero and 360 for my color. Okay. I'm working sort of with polar coordinates, so I have an R and a theta variable. I am looping over all these concentric circles. My color, I'm working with the hue saturation lightness model. Uh, my hue, we saw was varying with time. The saturation was chosen randomly, but just when the page started, and then it didn't change. And then I have the, uh, the lightness. And we see here, it depends on I. So it, the I is, moving me through the circles. So there is a sort of a radial dependence on the, the, the lightness depends on the, the radius, but there's also this T here. So it is changing both in time and radially. So right now we see it's uh, getting bright in the, in the middle part, and then it's getting, now it is sort of darker and now it's uh, light again. And that's this lightness behavior depending both on the radius and on the time. Okay, this is me getting the, using my delta and I to establish the radius of, you know, each time I iterate, I'm going around one of my circles. This is the radius of that circle. So if the radius of the circle is less than the half the side of the square, then that uh, circle is completely inside the square. And so I want it to be entirely uh, thick. So I'm in this portion in here and I want the circle to be uh, a, a wide circle in this design. So I'm generating, creating a circle I'm establishing its center, Cx and Cy, horizontal and vertical center, both at this M, this half size. I'm giving it the radius. Again, this, the radius was established for each iteration. It has no fill. The color is this color that I just established up here. And the width is uh, 0.02. I'm scaling it with the size of the design. So I'm using that M. Um, 
and this one is multiplied by two, and the down below we'll see the thin ones are multiplied by 0.01, so this is the thicker size, and I added that circle. So I'm adding, these are the small, but inside the square, the small but thick circles. Then in my, now I'm, so that was if R was less than square. This is if R is greater than square times the square root of two. So this is the radii bigger than the diagonal of the square. And so these are the very outermost circles and they are all thin. So I'm making a circle, same center, horizontally, vertically, the radius, depending on what iteration I am, no fill, the color. And now, oh, that was the first one. Sorry, now I'm down here on this second one. All the same things except a thinner circle. So if, if I'm in this part, this is the outermost circles. This was the innermost circles. And then these intermediate circles are broken up into parts, into eight parts. So we see if we go under one of these intermediate things, there's a thick and then a thin and a thick and a thin, a thick and thin, a thick and thin. So it's, uh, okay. And sort of now here was, uh, I sort of captured the design and uh, did some, made a like a coordinate system on top of it. And I'm just sort of showing you these sort of eight regions. Um, so it was thin, thick, and then thin, and then thick. Okay, so if I if I find some angle, and I have the sort of uh, the minus angle and the plus angle, so between that that angle for I'm going to I'm going to loop over something. So that's what this J is. The J is going to be zero, one, two, three. So here I am starting off with J equals zero. And if I subtract some angle, I'm going to find it, add some angle, I'm going to find that is a thin part. Then I'm going to go from that plus angle to the next, the angle with uh, J plus one, and that will be thick. And then I'll be uh, in the next, uh, then I'll increment J and do it again. So that's going to get me uh, my regions. So here, is me finding the angle in question. So uh, square is, again, smaller than radius. Um, I'm in these, uh, these in-between ones where the radius is bigger than the side of the square. And the, the way I get that angle that I'm desiring is the arc cosine, which the JavaScript math library has defined. So I'm just using square over radius. That's a number less than one. And I am taking its arc cosine, and that is giving me an angle. And then uh, the, I'm looping over sort of uh, four things, j equals zero, one, two, three. And then I'm going to make two paths, the thin path and the thick path. And so I'm making two paths per iteration. And so, and iterating four times. So that is those sort of eight regions all together that we talked about. Okay, I'm making a path. The main attribute of a path is this thing called D. And the first thing that you put into a path gets labeled with a capital M and that is the point at which you start. And so I am, M is my center and both horizontally and vertically. And I am adding uh, my radius times the cosine of some angle, and that angle depends on that, uh, depends on J. So I'm going to, that's going to move me around the, the circle as I iterate over J. I have this theta uh, that we talked about and that came from the cosine. And then there's this omega t. The omega t is what's making it go round and round. What's making it rotate. So that's that's me finding the x, and that point I want in here is the y. So that's the first point of the path I'm creating. Now SVG paths 
have lots of variations. They have a uh, quadratic Bezier and cubic Bezier. And you can have lines in these paths. Um, I want an arc. And so uh, if I'm creating an arc, then I use the letter A. Okay, the last part of the path is going to be the ending point of the path. So let's jump down there for a second. There I'm going to, here I did some minus theta, here I'm doing plus theta. So I'm going from, here's my J of zero, I'm going from the minus theta to the plus theta. All right, so that was the final point. So I'm concatenating together all this. D, M is the starting point. The last thing in D is the ending point. And then uh, I have an A to specify an arc. I have the arc is really the arc of an ellipse. So it has two radii. So I have to specify sort of an X radii and a Y radii. For me, it's a circular arc, so they are the same. I can um, rotate if it is an ellipse. This won't make any sense for me because I have a circle. But if I if it were an elliptical path, I could rotate that elliptical path. That's this next part. I just put in a zero. There's no sense for me to rotate the path since it's since my two radii are, are the same anyway. And then there are these uh, other two parameters, sort of, I have these two points and I've got to specify uh, sort of where the uh, ellipse is, uh, sort of, you know, you can, if I have these two points and I say they're on this ellipse, well, they might, it might be sort of a small angle uh, to connect them, or it might be a very large angle to connect them. Um, or, and also the, uh, the, 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 the circle or the, the ellipse might be on sort of different sort of sides of like the two points. And so that's what these parameters are giving. And for what I want, it's zero and one. Maybe I'll make another video explaining these parameters in more detail, but I'm just going to say for now, I wanted zero and one. So this was, again, I'm making my path. I said where I'm starting, M, the last thing in my path, in my D, my D attribute is the ending point. Then the A specifies that I am making uh, a path. Then I'm making an arc path, not a Bezier path, not any other, not a linear path, not a Bezier path, but an arc path. I have my two radii. For me, they're the same. I have the orientation of my ellipse, but since I have a circle, that doesn't mean anything for me. And then there are these two other uh, parameters. And for me, the right ones were zero and one. So I made a path. I made its D, my D, which we just defined up there, no fill. The stroke was this color, and this was my thin width, and I added. The next one is almost, uh, so I'm starting this one, where this one ended, uh, J and uh, theta plus theta is where the next part, the thick part, begins. So now I'm here in the thick part and I'm going from the J plus theta to the to one higher J. So I'm going to say J plus one to the minus theta. So here I am starting with J and plus theta and I'm going to J plus one and minus theta. That's this fat part of the curve. And again, it's an arc two radii, orientation of the ellipse, and these other two parameters, zero, one for me for this, and 
add the path, set the D, no fill, make the stroke, and then this is 0.02 times M. This is the, the fatter one. And then I, again, I'm looping over J. And so that gets me sort of all the way around all eight of these sort of partial circles, all these sort of partial arcs. And that is my result. Okay. And well, there's my clear intervals. Often I just erase it here. This time I just comment it out. So this is at the bottom of my function called by the timer. And when I am debugging, I have erased to my console logs. But um, if I had, uh, if I wanted to see what was going on, uh, either uh, looking at the console or explicitly an error message in the console or uh, write something to the console with a console log, I could clear the interval and stop the timer after it was called once. And then I'm just, I'm not generating, you know, error after error, just one set of errors for me to uh, fix. All right, that's what I want to show you on this one. Thanks for your attention.